fullness of this moment, we pause and reflect with those we love on what it means to flourish, to let ideas and experiences ferment for four years, and then unfold with limitless possibilities as we embrace our emotions as an offering that comes from having been authentically present to and engaged in this education and community. We reflect on everything we have gained, pausing to remember what it took to get here, mindful of the challenges along the way, the pandemic, working for equity, inclusion, and social justice, and our own inner growth. And we pause to acknowledge and remember those who have nurtured us, inspired and worked hard to make this day possible. Those who are here today, those who celebrate with us from a distance, and loved ones who passed away, who enriched our lives and are here in spirit. We remember them, especially our classmates, Daniel Cortez and Hank Bedingfield, in this space, as we hold and join in a moment of silence together now. As we breathe deeply and slowly, may the wisdom of what we hold as sacred and what is important to us surround us, giving us strength to be here together, to honor our experience of this place and our time at CC. May it be so. Greetings, and thank you for trudging through the spring winter wonderland to be here. These are moments of pivotal transition, mirroring the one we had just four years prior. To the parents who helped us move in for the very first time four years ago, thank you and welcome back. To my fellow students, I wanted to take a moment to speak on my hopes for us as we continue forth into our lives leaving behind the place that housed and supported us as we grew into ourselves. I hope we have moments of contentment and easy satisfaction. I hope we all get to taste the excitement of things to come. Excitement in this moment of transition has become tangled with the context of new spaces that we will eventually call home. Be slow and realize the power of patience. Time is a powerful agent and offers us bittersweet helping hand. In this time of urgency and stress, rest becomes not favorable, but crucial to our growth. I urge us to pause, perhaps just for today, to honor and celebrate ourselves for what we have experienced. To stop and appreciate all that exists in the minds and bodies that have worked to get us here. We're amazing. And as we take another step forward into our lives, let us regard ourselves as glorious yet tender-hearted, <laughs> allowing ourselves the room to embrace our setbacks not as failures but as moments of growth. The reality is, is that we don't know what lies ahead of us, but my hope is rather than focusing on a sense of control, we focus on our ability to navigate hardships as they come. 
so many people, many of whom are sitting in these very seats in front of me, have aided us with their strength, wisdom, and exuberant love. Love that I know will continue to guide me and support us in our adventures to come. I cannot say how proud and grateful I am to have so many wonderful people around me, classmates, parents, faculty members, and can say with strong confidence that our paths will be bright with love and fulfillment, big and small. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so proud to be the 14th president of this incredible, remarkable institution, Colorado College, and to see all of our graduates, the class of 2022, sitting here celebrating all of your accomplishments, and we'll have more to celebrate tomorrow. But I want to welcome all of you here for this very special day. Before proceeding, I want to acknowledge that Colorado College is located within the unceded territory of the Ute peoples. I ask you to join me in honoring the ancestors of our various peoples, nations, tribes, and families whose struggles for justice on this land inspire us. Graduates, class of 2022, these past four years, you've had a college experience that none of us could have predicted. Upon arriving at Colorado College, you made friends, shared ideas, dived into fascinating classes, received guidance from caring Colorado College community members, explored new interests, and broadened your world. But then, the unimaginable happened. And all of that was disrupted by a global pandemic in your sophomore year. So how did you respond to that challenge? You could have given up on college. You could have approached your classes less seriously. You could have disconnected from your friends, from your professors, and from your mentors. But you didn't do that. You didn't do any of that. Instead, you rose to the occasion. You adapted to online learning. You engaged in Zoom classroom discussions and presentations. You continued meeting with your student organizations and clubs, and you stayed as close as you could to each other, even if from a distance. And not a single piece of that was easy, but you did it. So this fall, I was thrilled to begin my first year at Colorado College in person and on campus. And the only reason we were able to remain together in person all year is because of your commitment to community. And for that, I thank you. And now you are at this incredible moment. This is a time to reflect on what you learned on all that you have accomplished and how this very unlikely Colorado College experience has shaped you. This weekend, we celebrate you and all that you have become during your time here at Colorado College. You have left your mark. You have already wowed us here and I and we can't wait to see all that you will do to change the world in the same way that you have changed us and Colorado College. So I will have so much more to share with all of you tomorrow, but right now, let me say congratulations and introduce Matthias Valder for welcoming remarks. Thank you and good afternoon. I am beyond honored to welcome all of you, students, faculty, family, and friends, 
to this year's baccalaureate. And thank you so much for joining us this weekend to celebrate our graduating seniors, some of whom I call my friends. <laughs> On behalf of my class, I want to particularly thank all faculty and administrators. Your dedication to teaching has provided us with an energetic and flexible educational experience that gave us the necessary skills to excel inside and outside the classroom, proven by outstanding performances by my classmates every Tuesday at Tony's Trivia. <laughs> I would also like to thank family and friends for being here today. Whether you came by car or just like my mother, took more than two planes to be here, your presence means the world. Thank you for continuously believing in us, inspiring us, and endlessly loving us. Lastly, and arguably most importantly, I want to thank my fellow students for creating a loving, dynamic, supportive, and stimulating space that I was able to call home for the last four years. Whether it's study sessions, intramural sports, student clubs, jewelry classes, midnight rustles, or simply asking, what's the move? <laughs> you were here for each other, continuously creating and maintaining community. And the need for this community has never been stronger than right now. I hope everyone knows that they have the love and support that they need and deserve. It is now my honor to introduce one member of this community and friend, Greg Cullen, who will be giving the remarks on behalf of this class. Thank you, Matthias. Sometimes dumb people say smart things. I hope the next five minutes are one of those times. <laughs> Last month, I was wandering across Europe. While great overall, I had a tragic realization. You can't escape familiar questions in foreign places. One night, a taxi driver asked, so, what do you do with an English degree? I told him, I don't know. I then invoked another dumb person who may have said a smart thing, former, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. In 2002, Rumsfeld falsely asserted that the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein possessed nuclear weapons and pressed the United States to invade on said basis. One journalist challenged how he could know this. Rumsfeld paused. He then responded, as we know, there are three knowns. There are no knowns, that is to say, there are things we know, we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are some things we know, we don't know. But we also know there are unknown unknowns, which are truths we don't know, we don't know. Turns out Rumsfeld didn't know he didn't know. But you can't say he didn't warn us about the dangers of cluelessness, which is one lesson I hope we have learned the last four years, the value of humility. In any case, tomorrow, one known will unite us. We will leave with a paper that reads Bachelor of Arts. It won't state our majors, nor will we hope to be doctor, engineer, artist. Rather, it will be an affirmation of whom we chose to be four years ago, liberal arts scholars. More than the immediate application of our education, we pursued something more useful, unbridled curiosity. By considering everything from classics to computer science, we sought unknown unknowns 
alongside our study of the knowns. Unfortunately, this practice, the liberal arts, is becoming rare as we enter a world increasingly interested in financial, technical, and practical expertise. Such pursuits use the known knowns to pursue known unknowns. Such pursuits also presume that learning should be done with the end application in mind. As we will see, however, what is occupational is not always practical. Without the open-mindedness of the liberal arts, blind spots, unknown unknowns, will emerge, or worse, never be discovered. To illustrate this, we must consider American engineer Thomas Midgley, Jr. In many ways, Midgley could be one of us. His research led to over 100 patents. He won many awards. He gave many talks. His biggest claim to fame? Tetra ethyl lead. In the 1920s, Midgley was tasked with creating a fuel that made cars quieter. So he did. He discovered by adding one lead atom to gasoline, he produced a cheap fuel that didn't smell, protected engines, and of course, made cars quieter. Midgley was celebrated. So, what was the harm? Forty years later, lead was discovered everywhere in the oceans, at the North Pole, and even in ourselves. When comparing modern teeth to Egyptian mummies, scientists discovered that Americans had a thousand times more lead in their bones. Today, the lead dispersed in the 20th century is sought to explain nearly two-thirds of all intellectual disabilities. One study estimates that Midgley's lead led to a global decrease of 800 million IQ points. Midgley's problem, he was too set on his ends to question his means. Midgley was too concerned with using his known knowledge of chemistry to solve a known unknown, the existence of a more financially appealing fuel. Midgley never stopped to wonder, nor did he wander from the known road to the unknown destination. He stayed the course of seemingly practical success to everyone's detriment. Yes, we all came to Carter College to increase our practicality in the workforce. Maybe we came to CC to have a career like Midgley's, minus the fallout. Nevertheless, more than those two goals, we came to wonder and wander. We came to take classes on poetry and game theory, to swim and camp with friends, not because we worried about utility, but because we trusted variety. Here's the irony. Often when you opt for practicality, you end up ineffective. Sometimes a nonlinear path is the most efficient. Sometimes the most useful insights, from the microwave to penicillin, arise beyond the outskirts of our known periphery in unknown unknowns. It is not always obvious which lessons will be most helpful. This is why, as liberal arts students, we study so many. The liberal arts are a game theory of probabilities. In the pursuit of practicality, not all who wonder are lost. This is the task of the liberal arts, to use ostensibly aimless curiosity to discover and dispel, to ask questions even when it seems impractical. This is how the transcendent insights are found. This is how we make the world a better place. I'm not saying reading Frankenstein would have saved Midgley from scientific disaster, but maybe it would have made him more humble and more practical. So let us wonder and wander off into the world. And who knows, maybe with all this wondering and wandering, you'll even end up in the backseat of a Greek taxi, ranting about Rumsfeld and 1920s engineers to defend your overpriced English degree. I would now like to introduce Chidera Apamaram to the stage for a song. I want to leave my footprints on the sands of time. Know there 
was something that meant something that I left behind when I leave this world I'll leave no regrets leave something to remember so they won't forget I was here I lived I loved I was here I did I've done everything that I wanted and it was more than I thought it would be I will leave my mark so everyone will know I was here I want to say I lived each day until I die and know that I meant something in somebody's life the hearts I have touched will be the proof that I leave that I made a difference and this world will see I was here I lived I loved I was here I did I've done everything that I wanted and it was more than I thought it would be I will leave my mark so everyone will know I was here I lived I loved I was here I did I've done everything that I wanted and it was more than I thought it would be I will leave my mark so everyone will know I was here I just I would now like to welcome Justin T to the stage to welcome our commencement, our, our baccalaureate speaker. <laughs> It is my great honor today to introduce the 2022 baccalaureate speaker, Professor Nina Grover. Nina is a mother, biochemist, and above all, an educator. Biochemistry is a tough subject with a thousand moving parts that it's easy to be overwhelmed. But Nina has this uncanny ability to turn that complexity into a thing of beauty. Her excitement and zest for knowledge is infectious and always leads to a uniquely charged academic environment. This doesn't mean Nina will make things easy for you, though. If I had to pick one word to best describe Nina's teaching style, it would be challenging. 
Nothing seems to give Nina more joy than challenging her students to push past their limits. She has a genuine vested interest in ensuring her students flourish and believe in their own abilities. Any student of hers will attest that you can always count on Nina's help or advice. However, be prepared for some honesty because she does not will back her punches. Nina also utilizes her position as a professor to empower and round out her students. Whether we talk about the impact of racism or ethical practices in science, excuse me, Nina makes it a given to discuss the institutions in place that influence the STEM field. Because in her words, it's easy to be a scientist without perspective. But what I respect the most about Nina is her commitment towards utilizing her knowledge to better our community. Today is no exception. In her speech entitled, The Trees Know We Are Here, Nina will challenge you today on our notions of life, interconnectivity, and the privilege of consciousness. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Nina Grover. Thank you, Justin, for your kind introduction. Class of 2022, it is my distinct honor to be standing here talking to you. At this moment, receiving your well-earned degrees. Your liberal arts education has given you the knowledge and awareness of the world. But what is knowing? What is awareness? What is life? Who am I? Who are you? Today, I will tell you my version of this story. Who we are, where we came from, and some related thoughts that might provide some perspective as you continue to find your place in this universe. You have been collecting your own answers to these questions with 32 or so formal classes and thousands of moments that occurred while you were here, while you were skiing, swimming, hiking, or having long conversations in the middle of the night, likely right under my window. <laughs> Some of you know me as your neighbor who asks you to pipe it down. You are graduating after two years of disruptions that appended your college education, a time that has been challenging. There is much grief. You were supposed to be hanging out with your friends, deepening your social connections, and challenging your mind. You instead had to learn to zoom in and zoom out in more ways than one. We are very glad that we had your final year back together. You made it. Your time at CC, your relationships, and in-person learning all became more precious, things that we had taken for granted when you started. Today, we are here to celebrate your time at CC in all its complexity. These years are just a beginning of a lifelong journey of learning, connecting, and growing. When I had just started at CC, an eminent guest speaker asked us if oxygen was alive, since we cannot live without it. What is being alive? When do things come alive? My own research is on RNA. Most people hadn't heard of this molecule until recently. Many who had encountered it 
they saw it in introductory biology classes, you learned that RNA carries instructions from DNA to proteins. For those of you who didn't step into barns, I'm here for you. No extra charge this time. Did you know that less than 2% of the human genome, the human DNA, is made of parts that we call genes? The genes make the RNA that makes the proteins that makes us. Compare that to 8% of the human DNA that comes from retroviruses, parts of us that, comes, that came from these viruses are an essential part of who we are like the genes that allow mammals to make the placenta so that the fetus is fed and not treated like an invader. Brain cells share information by using virus-like particles that go between cells. We are just beginning to see our interconnections with all creatures on this planet. RNA is proposed to be the original molecule that carried information from one generation to the next. The interaction between viruses and cells likely started somewhere at the beginning of life. Let's first talk about where life may have come from. Let's start at a time approximately 13.8 billion years ago when there was a lot of energy that perhaps was a little contained in a tight spot and a little hot, like 10 billion degrees Fahrenheit. So it created a Big Bang. You may have heard of this Big Bang. Is this why we start telling children to give each other some space? Is this the original cosmic lesson? Anyway, back to our story. The Big Bang instantly made some subatomic particles, quarks and gluons, that made atoms, mostly hydrogen, to make some helium and lithium. These atoms then pulled on each other to make stars and galaxies. The dance of molecules created the universe. We will leave the story of dark matter aside. Skipping ahead a few billion years, it leads us to our little world here. About four and a half billion years ago, we have a star, our sun, and eight or so biggish planets that are being pulled around it. One even does it kind of its own way. You understand, sometimes you have to do it your own way. A big chunk of ice fell on Earth, brought us water, some of the water was part of the clouds that made the sun. In the next part of the story, a bunch of little rocks were sent to Earth with molecules of life. In another telling, the rocks here on Earth gathered the ingredients to make the molecules of life. This was the life before cells. This is where stories of RNA start. It was in this soup where RNA molecules begin to copy themselves. They start to combine other molecules to make new molecules, starting a process that some of us see as the beginning of life. Give or take a billion years, the big molecules develop a layer of fat. Suddenly, we have a prototype for a cell. A new world of cells is born. These early cells ate things that we didn't know were food. Then they learned to split into two. Why? Why cells multiply remains a bit of a mystery. RNA then created proteins, then created DNA. The eating, growing, splitting of cells is the thing we call life. It took another while before new types of cells were made. They shared material between the early cells. We call these eukaryotic cells. Yeast, fungi, plants, bugs, humans, all of us owe our existence to these early cells. Cells quickly figured out 
diversity was important for life, for survival. A single thing could kill all identical cells. Two half cells got created, sperm and egg got made, and out came many new creatures. Fungi and plants were made. Trees got made that made oxygen. Oxygen got made, water got made. Dinosaurs got made, had their time on Earth. It took some time, but the trees decided to grow the small mammals into bigger mammals by feeding them legumes. Throw in a few more million years, and large mammals like humans get made. It took very specific two half cells to make each of you. Were you adding up the numbers? Yes, it took a few billion years to make us. How can we not appreciate that we are forged in the stars, made by the trees, and are connected to all that life that is around us? All the creatures on Earth that make up life are made of atoms, made in the stars. We are all dances of molecules, each of us made to order. Each of us has inherent value. Each of us is precious. We must value ourselves, have confidence that we are meant to be here. And humanity has a purpose for our limited time on Earth. We must take care of ourselves. We must take care of each other. We must take care of all the creatures on Earth. Only when we respect ourselves do we become capable of respecting the life that is around us. We can coexist with other creatures. Human exceptionalism, or belief in our own individual greatness, leads us to pulling others down instead of pulling, pulling ourselves up. Each of us will make some of these mistakes. How we deal with it is what matters. Genomically speaking, humans are more similar to each other than different. We are 99.9% .9 alike. A single clan of monkeys has more genomic differences than all the humans combined. And yet, we fight over the slightest of differences in skin color, language, or religion, you name it. We need to appreciate each other and let us each reach our full potential. Our cells do it all the time. In each of our cells are thousands of molecules. Many are made brand new each hour, some each day. Others are new each week. Our molecules are continuously changing, adapting, talking, collaborating. They make proteins, sugars, fats, hormones, all that we are. On a molecular level, we could be a new person each day. Nothing is stopping us from being a better version of ourselves tomorrow. Each day is a new day, a new beginning. Each cell is a new beginning. We must give ourselves that chance. Every cell is a complex world, with new molecules being made and degraded. The cellular processes are not random. Thousands of proteins are being made per second. These are being folded at speeds that are unimaginable to do a million different things every single second in a precise order and at a precise time. It is a miracle that we wake up at all, let alone walk, talk, think. If we counted all our cells, we are about 43% human. The rest are our resident microbes. As we learn more about health, we will be balancing our microbiota instead of taking pills. To the microbes that live on us, we might be their entire universe. These microbes are a part of us. They take care of us 
and we of them. We do not exist without each other. All communal interactions are a balancing act. When the balance goes awry, the same things that were keeping us healthy can make us sick. Or it could be a new microbe. Plants come to our rescue again. Most of our medicines come to us from plants. The web of life is complex with many different types of communication. I am sure you've heard of trees are talking to each other. They use the language of molecules. The forest knows and shares the knowledge of your presence. A grand old tree sees its neighbor. It sees all its neighbors and sends them information. It talks to the mushrooms and bacteria. The trees are interacting, sharing, breathing, responding to their environment. The forest acts as one giant organism, interdependent and alive. The mushrooms communicate using electrical signals, like those of our neurons. Are they talking using words, but not sound? The fish are chatty too. Some are pretty loud. Maybe it was a graduation party. <laughs> Our existence is fantastical. There are many worlds that we are just beginning to discover within our world. There is so much more to learn. Every grain of sand, every pebble has a story. I wonder if every molecule has a story. We creatures will come and go, but our atoms, hydrogens, carbons, oxygens, etc., are here to stay to create new molecules, new creatures, new dances, new stories. Remember that you are a very particular dance of a very specific set of molecules that were made just for you. Appreciate yourself and others. We are all a miracle. Be open to new ideas. Channel the curious and bright child that you once were. Be kind and compassionate. Know that the universe created you, especially when your identities are unacknowledged or invisible. You are meant to be here. Don't let others' judgment stop you from being you. You don't need to be anyone else. There's only one you. The universe wants you to know that it took a billion years to make you. Sit under a tree. Take care of the soil. Bond with your pets. They will remind you that there are many ways to care and share. May the wisdom grace and strength of trees go with you as you venture into the journey ahead. I will end this talk with a quote from a student, Fair Juarez Duran, who took my RNA class recently. He writes, there is an element of poetic justice to the scale at which the universe, universe forms in terms of time and mass to produce beings as keenly condensed and complex as humanity and life in general. In consideration of all that, how else can we approach our existence if not with an air of piety? Whether it is through a socially constructed religion or discipline of science, life and all its interactions are universally rare and thus should be regarded as the ultimate privilege. For not all molecules reminiscent of stardust are awarded the privilege of consciousness. Thank you all for listening. It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Stephen Sigmund, who will offer his reflections.
here's something cool I learned in computer science. Imagine digging two holes in the ground and next to them you have a big pile of pebbles. You can put pebbles in the holes, you can take pebbles out of the holes, and you can copy the pebbles from one hole into the other. With just those parts and operations, this contraption has the same computing power as any modern day computer. Sure, it might take a little longer, but with enough time and pebbles, you can build any program you could run on a computer. When my professor first explained this concept, I thought, how is this knowledge even remotely useful? <laughs> we already have computers. <laughs> but then I came to realize that this pebble machine is valuable, not because it's practical, but because it demonstrates our ability to turn something so simple into something incredibly powerful. There are still pebbles and holes, we just viewed them differently. When I returned to campus for the first time in over a year, I felt the need to do something important, to leave a legacy so that I could make up for the time we lost. But when we fixate on things we could do, it's easy to forget about the things we can do. I ended up finding the most meaning this year by reaffirming things I already knew about myself, that I like telling stories, that I'm good at asking questions, and that somehow, the more I learn about computers, the more mysterious they become. Oftentimes it seems like if we want to change the world, we need to change ourselves first, without considering that we already have all the tools we need. We just need to view ourselves differently. Potential isn't discovered, it's unlocked. If a prism isn't refracting sunlight into a rainbow, it isn't broken, you're just not holding it the right way. Most people probably don't spend much time thinking about pebbles and holes in their daily lives, but if we can make them into something as powerful as a computer, we must reevaluate the parts of ourselves that we overlook. With enough time and pebbles, we can do some pretty amazing things. I'd like to invite everyone to rise and remain standing and welcome Jafar Chamjic to lead us in the Colorado College Hymn.
Good afternoon. My name is Alina Paracha, and I am honored to be delivering today's benediction. It feels like it was only yesterday that we first arrived to campus. Unlike this weekend, the air was so warm on those first few days. The sun's rays cradled the belief that anything was possible. And the mountains, they looked as big as our futures. We had forever in front of us, but even then, I recognized the fragility of time. Forever would pass in an instant, and it did. Isn't it fitting that on our last days, we get stuck in a perpetual windstorm, a paradigm of the turbulence that shook our college years? We have been through a lot to get to this point, but there is grace in all trials, and I am grateful to recognize the consistencies within the chaos. Treasure the people who keep you close, even when circumstances bring you miles apart, who unbeknownst to themselves may have been the reason that you kept going. The beauty of our shared experience at this institution is that even if we are unaware, there are a multitude of people who believe in us. Our lives are connected. No matter if our paths only cross briefly, and even if they never did, we are bound together because each of our souls decided to linger at this place and grow a little. Unfortunately, time has slipped us yet again, and we find ourselves at the end of another chapter. Today, we leave this space, our final night as students of Colorado College. And as we navigate our futures and explore the complexities of life, we will be presented with numerous paths. Perhaps you know the route you will take, or rather, you have determined which directions are not suited for your goals. Regardless, as we uncover our purposes and discover how to fulfill them, remember to believe in yourself. The only force capable of limiting you is yourself. Nothing is as powerful as the currency of belief. So on the days you lose hope, think about this place. Think about your friends who cheered you on, your professors who believed in you, and your families who, only, who always stood by your side. In someone's eyes, you are the world. And this weekend, we are surrounded by so many who are endlessly proud of us. When I reflect on our college experience, I am reminded of the few times I have seen a shooting star, a fleeting sight capable of making you feel special for you were lucky enough to catch a glimpse. Our time here may have passed in a blink of an eye, but it has changed who we are and has forever inspired us. Nowadays, the mountains seem smaller, evidence that we have all grown in some ways. And as the wind carries us from this place to the next, Always hold within yourself the feelings that encompassed you on your very first days, that the future is bright and that anything is possible.